So I'm going to use as my jumping off point the, uh, the wonderful recirculating comb filter thing and um, start with one detail about, uh, about PD that you might want to know about. So here's the sound. This is the uh, Carpless Strong instrument. <coughs> And the, um, well, not exactly carpal strong. This is noise going into a, a uh, recirculating comb filter, right? Okay, now, the, the thing that I want to do with this, I, we've had enough delays now, but what I want to do is use delays as a way of motivating uh, filters, because indeed this is a filter. You're hearing white noise, well, you don't hear it, but there's white noise going in, and there's this stuff coming out, and that's by virtue of the fact that, from one point of view at least, the delay network that we're putting the white noise through is, is filtering it. It's, it's, uh, it. It has a different gain for different frequencies. It doesn't have a flat frequency response. It has a comb-shaped frequency response, if you like, which is why we call this particular thing a comb filter. Well, filters are, um, well, go back. The comb filter is the one filter that you can explain easily without having to say anything mathematical or excessively mathematical. The basic deal is that um, if you just put a single sample in here, if, if you made a signal that was zero except that it had one impulsive sample at one point, then you can imagine what would happen is the impulse would come out and then the delay later it would come out a little smaller and then the delay later again it would come out a little smaller and so on and you'd have a sequence of impulses at a fixed length from each other and that would you would hear a pitch um, or you could you could say what were the frequencies present in that sequence of pulses and you would see that certain frequencies were present much, much more heavily than others were. Um, or you can do what I'm doing here and just throw white noise at it and notice that you know, something quite different from white noise comes out. And the two things that you can vary are the selectivity of the filter, and that's to say there's no selectivity at all and here's total selectivity and here's something in between. And also the delay time is now controlling the well, the frequencies that the that the filter likes. The trouble with this as a as a thing is that it it really only does that one thing. It, it uh, no matter what frequency you ask for, it will let through that frequency and all the and all of its multiples, uh, there thereby deserving the name comb filter. But uh, that's not everything that you could possibly want a filter to do. Uh, a very standard thing that you would like a filter to be able to do is simply um, simply attenuate higher frequencies but let low, lower frequencies through or vice versa. And this is not a thing that you can use in any direct way to do that kind of thing. So um, before I go on about how to use this way of thinking to design filters um, in, in more general, oh, let, um, let me pop up one level and say I'm going to tell you a little bit about filter design but not the whole story. Um, if you look at the textbook, the longest chapter is about filter design because there are dozens of different kinds of filter designs or, or dozens of kinds of different filters that have different design methodologies and you would be studying for years if you wanted to study all of them and even even just making a decent cross-section of them is, is a lot of work and more, more, basically more stuff than we could possibly crowd into three days of classes that remain. Um, even if we didn't want to mess with Jim and a couple of other things too next week, which is going to take precedence. So, so I'm not going to do the whole filter design yoga. I'm just going to tell you how you think about it and also show you how to just use filters in case you don't want to get involved in filter design yourselves, which might be most of you anyway. So, so there will be theory, but there's also just going to be some hand-waving, here's how you do stuff kinds of stuff that, uh, that's less honest but more useful somehow. So uh, in preparation for that, the first thing that I want to tell you is a little bit of, of uh, PD lore, which is the following thing. I mentioned a week ago that, of course, there, not of course, but as it turns out, there's a maximum pitch you can possibly get out of this thing, which corresponds to the smallest delay, the smallest recirculating delay that you can possibly get, which is, which is 64 samples, which at 44 kilohertz 0.1 is about 1.45 milliseconds, which corresponds to about 700 something hertz. 
Right. So the so the frequency, the, the resonant frequency of this particular filter is one over the delay time. So the shorter the delay time, the higher the frequency, and 1.45 milliseconds corresponds to about 700 cycles per second. All right. So um, that is an artificial constraint that is brought about by the fact that uh, there's blocking. In other words, and this is the thing that's easy to say in Parrot, and, and it takes a little bit of thinking to understand it, but if everything is crunching samples in blocks, then this thing creates a, the, the read, which has, to, which has to happen before the write. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't look that way, but this thing is reading delays before this thing is writing them, because there are dark lines from here through there, and there's no dark line from here to there. So the real order of operation is delay read, multiply, add, and output, and delay write. Okay. Um, the, the fact that you have to read a whole block of 64 samples, which, by the way, is only for uh, runtime efficiency's sake, um, dictates that if you're going to now read a bunch of stuff and then write it, you have to write it 64 samples into the future. In other words, pick up a block of 64 samples. Now we're going to compute some other stuff. You have to compute. You can't compute anything earlier than the next 64 samples than the ones you just had computed when you read those. And so you're going to have at the minimum, at minimum some uh, a, a delay of 64 samples if you want to scoop into your own past, which is what this network wants to do. Um, usually that's fine, but in, a situ in situations like this, sometimes you don't want that to be true. And if you don't like this and want to fix it, then you can do the following thing, which I will now try to demonstrate and talk about at the same time. You can uh, maintain local control of block sizes by making sub-windows of patches and using a special object which is called block tilde to set the block size of the sub-window. So here, what we would do is we would say, uh, object please, let's get, um, I'm going to call it small block, spell it right. This is now a sub patch, and what I'm going to do is, uh, is dump some of this stuff into the sub patch. Uh, let's do it this way. Let's dump, let's just grab all this stuff. There's a receive, so I can put that in there, but this should be an inlet. We're going to make it sub patch here. So let's do this. And not that. And command X to cut. Now control X to cut. Paste. So here now is the recirculating part of the delay network. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but now to be clearer, I'm going to put it in the order that it really will be sorted in, which is to say it has to read first and then do its stuff and then write. The, write, the delay write is the object which formally at least doesn't have any output because its output is to write the thing into the delay line, right? like DAC tilde, same kind of deal. Now, um, we're going to want to hear the result, so what I'll do is make there be an outlet of the, whoa, come here. Uh, a signal style outlet which will which will use to hear the output of whatever this thing is and that by the way is going to create this outlet here on the containing object and so I, hey why can't I do that huh all right so now we're going to listen to this like this and meanwhile there are two inputs that we need, the recirculation gain, should I have the delay? No, the delay time we had controlled out there. So the recirculation gain will be an inlet of the normal type, or the message type, I should say. And that went here. And then meanwhile, we'll have a signal to add to it, which we already had, which will be an inlet tilde. which we're going to add to it. I'm going to do it like that. Yeah. It's better to do this. And now over here, what this means is that the... Well, let's keep it like that. So what I did was I put the inlets in order so that the signal inlet is first and then the control inlet. And I did that so that 
you would see a clear signal chain. And then this control is going to go there. Now, let's restore ourselves to sanity here. Good. All right, now let's check if we actually have the same thing as we had before, maybe. Okay, so you still have the same problem. You can't get any, anywhere above whatever patch that is. And now I'll go in here. This is the sub patch again, and say, and this is why I put this all in a sub patch. Is I'll say block. And in fact, I'm going to be extreme today and say, let's have a block size of one. Mm -hmm. All right, now with that, okay. Uh, if you care, which you might not yet, but will someday, um, a typical, this is a rule of thumb, a typical amount of overhead for getting into and out of tilde objects in PD or in other kinds of block things is about 20 samples worth of crunch. That depends on the object, so that's not a hard and fast rule. but. Um, a 64 sample block size means that you're paying for about 80 samples worth of computation per 64, and a one sample block size means you're paying for maybe 20-ish samples instead of one. So this thing only has about 1 20th the compute efficiency of the surrounding patch. This would be a good reason not to do this just for no reason at all. But of course, if you want to do something like what I'm doing here, read something out of the delay line and then do something to it and write it back in. That might be something that you want to do at a lower block size so that you can have a smaller delay in the loop. Right? And now we can check whether that actually happened. So blocks basically dictating how much power is going into that? Or like how much computing time is? Sort of. What it, okay, so what it really is doing is it's saying Every time PD wants you to compute 64 samples, or every time your parent window wants you to compute 64 samples to be totally accurate, instead of computing all 64 samples in one block, you will compute 64 blocks of one sample each. So what happens normally inside PD is when you ask it to do something like this, then this, then this, it does 64 samples of this, followed by 64 samples of this, followed by 64 samples of that. And you can see this using the print tilde object. Print tilde will just will print out however many samples it does in, in one block's worth of computation. Uh, that's where the, that's where the 64 samples come from that print tilde prints out for you. Um, if you say block tilde one instead of doing 64 samples of this and 64 of that and 64 of that and so on, it will do one 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 and then go around the loop 64 times, which is a lot more work, about 20 times as much work, but is nonetheless what you would have to do if you wanted to make a very short recirculating delay line. The shortest possible recirculating delay line you can have in digital land is one sample. Right? In other words, there's no possible way when you're reading this thing that you can read the current sample because it hasn't been written yet, So you, but you can read theoretically the very previous sample that got written here if the block size is as small as one. Now having done that, Let's see, I'm going to close this. Now that I've done that, then we get the ability to have hugely high pitches. In fact, the highest pitch you can ask for, I think, is the sample rate. Let me see if that's really true. Well, the pitch is 1 over the delay. And if the delay is one sample, then the pitch is the sample rate. What does it mean for the pitch to be the sample rate? It does not mean that there's a pitch at the sample rate because that, that frequency doesn't exist. There aren't any frequencies above the Nyquist. So if you like, there's a nice comb filter. And the comb filter has peaks every, well, at, at all multiples of a fixed frequency that you choose. But if you make that frequency be the sample rate, then one tooth of the comb reaches all the way from zero to Nyquist, and the next tooth of the comb reaches from Nyquist up past the sample rate and doesn't exist. So what we've done is we've taken a comb filter and turned it into a one 
lobe comb filter because there's only one, or one tooth comb filter if you like, because there's only one room, room for one tooth. Whose center frequency, by the way, or frequency is DC, is zero. Right? So, the, so the frequencies that a comb filter allows through are zero and then the resonant frequency, which is one over the delay time, and then twice the resonant frequency and so on. And all of those frequencies are, are above the Nyquist, except for DC, zero. So now what we've created is not what I just told you. Let's see, let's, so let's do it. Let's, let's, um, I'll turn this on and make the thing be as high as I can get it. Oh, wait, actually, before I do that, let me make this thing fatter so we can look at it. So let's have an eight unit wide one. Now I'll say, just go on up to the sample rate. Actually, if it's higher than the sample rate, I know the thing can't be a delay of less than one sample, so it's going to be a one sample delay now, so the resonant frequency will be the sample rate, which doesn't exist, or, is, or isn't the proper frequency. Okay, so now we have noise, but here's the original noise, and here's the comb filtered noise. So I told you there's a, you know, the, 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 the frequency where the good gain is, is at zero. What that means is that we've designed ourselves a low pass filter. So a low pass filter in some sense is a special case, a weird special case of a comb filter where you set the frequency of the comb filter to be the sample rate. Uh, actually, 100 is not a good number to use because that's unstable. Let's go down to 99 <laughs> or so. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, what we could at this point, is this possible to do? You could analyze, I mean, we could, we could actually graph this, but I don't want to, I don't want to uh, be too pedantic about things, but you could now analyze what would happen if you did something like uh, put an impulse into this filter. So an impulse would be a signal which has one sample that's non-zero followed by a bunch of zeros and preceded by a bunch of zeros too. So it's quiet for all time except at some time there's a, maybe a unit sample whose value is one and then silent again for all time. This is a signal that you would use just in a thought experiment to see what this filter does. right? And what it does is very simple. It Oh, wait, I'm sorry. So, here, so here's the design again. So we, each sample, we take what was there in the previous sample, uh, which suppose we, th thinking about just the first sample when the impulse comes in. Out, out here is zero because the filter's sitting at zero. It's at rest. In comes an impulse that's to say there's one sample. Sorry, here. There's one sample whose value is one. So out goes one. And by the way, one gets written into the delay line. One then comes out of here, and it gets multiplied by 0.99, which is what the thing is set to now. And out comes, so that says 0.99. So out goes 0.99, and it gets added to zero, because the impulse is over now. So it's one, 0.99, and then 0.99 squared, and then 0.99 cubed, and so on like that. So it's a falling exponential. All right. Now that raises an interesting question, which is, well, okay, so first off, uh, I haven't told you this, but an impulse is, it's not the same thing as white noise, but an impulse, if you think about it in terms of frequency content, has all frequencies present. Why? Because, well, from one point of view, what's a frequency it doesn't have? Or from another point of view, it doesn't have any time duration, so it can't have any one frequency louder than it has any other because it doesn't know what time is. That's not a that's a hand waving argument, but it actually works if you make it work rigorous. Um, what comes out is this thing, which is a sort of a lump, which has a duration which is longer or shorter depending on how you set the coefficient of the filter. In other words, if I set this to 0 0.99, it will take something like 100 samples to drop off by a factor of e. And if I set it to 0 0.98, by the way, I'm using numbers close to one so that you see a nice good exponential. If I say 0 0.98, then it takes 50 samples to drop off by a factor of E and so on like that. 
It's, it's, it's a falling exponential. It always has the same shape, if you like, except that it's getting squashed or stretched out in frequency, depending on the coefficient. And furthermore, if you think about that, the slower you played that exponential, that's to say the, the closer you got the coefficient to 1 and the longer that so-called impulse response lasted, the more low frequencies you would have compared to high frequencies, because the slower you'd be playing with them, the, the more lows you'd have. You slow something down, you get more lows. That also is a hand-waving argument. So, in some sense, you shouldn't be surprised at the fact, just from that description of what the impulse response is, you shouldn't be surprised at the, at the idea that as you push the gain toward 1, the thing gradually loses its high frequencies or picks up low frequencies compared to high frequencies. All right. You could ask for a better one. And or, or you could also ask for other stuff, but to, to talk about that, I have to talk about how we talk about the filters a little bit. So the trajectory so far has been, I started with this recirculating comb filter, and I made the, and I showed you the block tilde object that allows you to have one that's just one sample, and then I showed you that, hey presto, there, what we really have is a low pass filter. Um, yeah. So let me now, go to silly picture land and show you how I'm talking about these things. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, one thing that's maybe a little confusing for me is, in my experience using filters, there have always seemed to be things that add or subtract to the signal, you know, like, uh, to any one sample, you know, in place. I don't, I, I don't quite know how to describe it, but what you're showing us takes what happens in one sample and then seems to add information to the subsequent samples, you know, because it's got this decay. Is that the way all filters work? It is. Okay. Um. So it's actually, when you filter something, when you low-pass filter something, you're actually... You're making it last longer. Oh. Yep. In some sense. In other words, if you had a very, very short sound or utterance and put it through a filter almost of any sort, you'll end up with something longer than you started with. Uh, an extreme example is if you've tried, if you've messed around with an analog synth, try putting a, um, try putting something impulsive into a bandpass filter and set the cue way up. I'll tell you guys what all this stuff is later. And then you can hear it ring. So you can put in just a impulse and out comes ping like that and you can make it last longer depending on how high you set the cue. The thing resonates, rings. And filters in general are things that ring or sit there, whatever whatever you call it. Usually for most reasonable settings of the filter, the what it does, uh, you know, the the what do we say, the impulse response of the filter is short enough in time that, that, that doesn't become a factor. But you can set yourself up in situations where it indeed is a factor and I can show you an example of that maybe later on. With luck. Okay. So here's uh, just how one talks about filters. And this is just terminology, right? Um, the, I haven't shown you actually how to make any of this stuff except for that low pass filter, but I haven't even really analyzed that in depth yet. But these are just sort of qualitative terms that sometimes have units on them. Uh, here's what a low pass filter is, uh, as you describe it, if you were an audio engineer. And um, usually what you say is, there is a particular, mm, okay, so go, go to the store and buy a filter. They say, what, do you, what cutoff filter do you, what cutoff frequency do you want? Um, that is an oversimplification of what a filter really is, because there's never, no physical filter ever will allow some frequencies through and then completely block out other frequencies and have a, you just basically have just one frequency, which is a cutoff frequency. What there really is in most people's a way of describing it is a range over which the filter gets from its pass band to its stop band. So bands, again, the bands are just ranges of frequencies. That's old-fashioned radio talk. And so a low-pass filter is one that has a pass band and a stop band, and then there's a transition band, which is just where you don't know what the filter is doing. It's somewhere between the two. And then you can talk about the quality of the filter in terms of 
give me a filter and I want the transition band to be real skinny or I want the uh, other terms, ripple. You want the thing ideally to have an absolutely flat frequency response in the pass band. But it doesn't ever really in practice. It always goes up and down. And anything that goes up and down, if you're an e economist or an engineer and you're looking at a function and it has maximum minima, you call it ripple. Or sometimes you call it cycles, even if it's not. So engineers will call this ripple. Uh, it's just the fact that in any real filter, the, um, the frequency response will go up and down slightly, at least slightly, before it starts heading out in the transition band. And then in the stop band, you can say, what is the stop band attenuation? That's to say, this isn't ripple anymore. This is just stuff that, that still gets through in the stop band. One doesn't call it ripple. You don't care about there being a flat frequency response there. You just care for it to be gone. right? And so all you care about is what's the maximum value here compared to the value here, whatever you call that. So there's a stop band attenuation. And these things are all trading off against each other and off the complexity of the filter. You don't want to have arbitrarily com complex filters, partly because they will ring forever. The, the, the amount of time the filter rings, very roughly speaking, is, uh, is one over the transition band width. So you want a very clean transition band, you'll have a very ringy filter. Uh, you, so you will typically trade, you, you will care more about this and less about that, or might, maybe you care a whole lot about this, like if you're designing a low-pass filter for a digital audio, digital analog converter, you would care about having a nice flat frequency response there. Um, or you might care about having this thing be very low, or not, depending on what you need. So you, you make those things part of the specification of your filter, and some poor engineer runs off and well, actually cranks up some piece of code that, that designs a nice filter that does this for you. And hopefully it's a decently simple filter and not a complicated one. Not so much because you care about the computation time, but because you care about things like numerical accuracy, which tends to be more difficult to control as the filter gets more complicated. All right, so there's, uh, there's language which one uses to talk about low pass and in fact high pass filters. A high pass filter is the same thing as this, except that the pass band is up here and the stop band is down there. Um, and other stuff. Now, uh, next, how to talk about band pass filters. Here's a, here's a, a, a picture of what you might think of as a band pass filter specification. So there you have two different stop bands. You want it to stop stuff below and above the region you're interested in. There's, of course, because we're in reality, we have transition band, which we don't know about. That's where the filter is getting from the stop band of the thing, and then there uh, to the pass band, and then there's ripple again. So, a band pass filter is like a lower high pass filter, except that the pass band has both a low and a high frequency cutoff, and is correspondingly harder to design. And oh, stop band is the same, except the pa except there's a there's a stop band in the middle and there are pass bands on the outside, and then you would call it a stop band or sometimes a notch filter. Yeah? So essentially graphic equalizers are nothing but a bunch of band pass filters and selected It's worse. Uh, graphic equalizers, you want them to be you want them to be absolutely flat when you when you have all the um, what's there, when you have all the, the uh, sliders in the middle. And you will never be able to design these so that you can add them up and get exactly flat. And so you end up designing a completely different class of filters to use in the equalizer, which I'll show you in a second. Okay. So that's terminology for that. And now the stupid terminology for bandpass, this is the, you know, if you buy an analog synthesizer, you don't talk about the, uh, the pass band anymore. <coughs> what you talk about is the center frequency which is the middle of the pass band, and the pass band itself is kind of ugly. So, I mean, you could describe this filter in terms of a, you know, two transition regions and all the rest of it, but you don't. What you really describe a simple uh, band pass filter as is as having a center frequency and a bandwidth. The bandwidth here is, it's a, okay, so the band is just the part of it where you think the thing is allowing the signal through, and the bandwidth in this kind of a filter typically is measured by saying, Find the peak, and then choose some arbitrary number, which is usually three. Then you say, okay, go to the right until the thing drops three decibels. Now go to the left 
sorry, whatever left and right are. Then go to the other way, go the other way until it drops three decibels, and then you will see a region of the thing which is tip, which is characterized by the fact that it's within three decibels of its peak. And that's a way of just talking about the bandwidth of a filter if you if no one has specified a, a ripple value or a, or whatnot. And so then, basically, for describing a filter like that, it's adequate to describe just the center frequency and bandwidth. And sometimes people call this the, uh, the th mm, well, sometimes people call this the 3 dB bandwidth to, s to say that we chose that arbitrary number 3 to talk about it. Um, there's another knob that you get on a synth, which is called Q, which uh, stands for quality. And the Q of a filter is is a thing which uh, which is designed so that as you push the as you increase the value of Q, the filter itself gets sharper. Um, I'm I can't tell you in any very simple way why that would be a, a measure of the quality of the filter. <laughs> so don't worry about that. But um, so the quality is then defined so it should go up as the bandwidth goes down. And the let's see what's the right word the the textbook definition of the Q of a filter is it's the center frequency divided by the bandwidth. And that's a good unit to use because if it, um, if you're designing a, a, for instance for an analog synthesizer or another kind of application like that, if you're designing a filter that you would want to be able to change the center frequency of, it might actually be a good thing for the bandwidth to change uh, to be maintained as a fraction of the center frequency instead of being maintained as a constant. You could imagine doing both. You could imagine a filter that sweeps and the bandwidth stays the same. But then if you think about it, that filter would sound more selective if you tuned it up in the high frequencies than in the low. If the bandwidth is 50 hertz and if you say that the um, center frequency is 100, that's a very fat filter. But if the bandwidth is 50 and you say the center frequency is going to be 1,000, then 50 out of 1,000 is a very small variation, and, and then you'll hear that's a very sharp pitch. Um, to put that another way, if you wanted a filter whose bandwidth was one half tone, that would be a reasonable thing to ask for. That would be a filter that, uh, that was sharp enough that you would hear it as a, as a pitch, basically, right, to, to a pair of Western ears. So if you want the, the filter to sound like middle C, You'd like its 3 dB points to be halfway from C to C sharp and halfway from C down to B. Right? That would be a C filter. Well, that turns out to be a Q of 17. That's to say, all right, well, you know this. Uh, a half tone is a 6% increase in frequency or change in frequency. And 1 over 6% is about 17. So if you say, oh, right, so middle C over whatever middle C has to change by to get to the next one over is about 17. And that's true if you chose middle C or any other pitch on the piano. It's always going to be true that proportionally, one part in 17 gets you to the cracks between you and the next two keys. So Q equals 17 is a, is a one-half tone wide filter. And then, so if you, so if you make the, the controls on your filter be center frequency and Q, which is what the synth manufacturers typically do, then uh, it's good, you can set the thing to a higher or low center frequency and it has the same perceived width, which is the, which is the width as a, as a percentage of the center frequency. Another example of, of a useful value of Q is, what if you set the filter to be about a critical band width, or a critical band wide? Critical bands are these psychoacoustic things, um, which are typified Roughly, well, let's not go into it. <laughs> there are things you learned about in Music 170 that I want to try, don't want to try to explain because then you'd be talking psychoacoustics and then you get into arguments because no one can really make measurements about psychoacoustics. Um, but a critical band is roughly a third of an octave. And the reason you see all these third octave filter banks, and by the way, if you go buy an equalizer, frequently it'll be third octave, right? Um, that third octave is the critical band. And a third of an octave is, again, a number of half tones. It's four half tones. And so that corresponds to a Q of something like four-ish, well, four-ish. So a Q of four is about a third of an octave. It's still, no matter what uh, center frequency you choose. 
So those are reasonable values of Q. All right. Um, having told you all that, that's all I want to tell you about taxonomy of filters. Yeah, right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you one other thing, which is to answer your question better about equalizers. There are other filters running around besides low pass and band pass, which are frequencies where you specify not that it be one in the good part and zero in the bad part, but that it simply have a higher gain in one, in one frequency range than another. Uh, the simplest of these is called a shelving filter. And for a shelving filter, you say, well, what's going to be the frequency at which it transits or transitions? Transits? It's transition frequency. I don't know what the verb is there. Um, and then you say, what, what do you want the gain to be at low frequencies? What do you want the gain to be at high frequencies? And roughly at what frequency does it make its transition between the two? And if you have one of those, then you've got something that you could use to, to boost or to cut the bass or boost or cut the treble, depending on where you set the transition frequency. So those are things like the treble and bass controls on old-fashioned stereo amplifiers. Maybe they still make those. Or the low and high shelving filters on your equalizers. Okay. Um, whether the equalizer, by the way, is a parametric one or a, or a, what's the other, graphic one. Then you need all the filters in between. And to do that, you have an out-of-band gain and an in-band gain, so that if you set the in gain in-band and out-of-band gains both to be one, then the filter is doing nothing to you or for you. But then you can ask it, make the out-of-band gain always be one, which is an appropriate thing to do, but make the in-band gain be plus five decibels or minus five decibels, which would mean push or attenuate uh, this particular frequency range. And there are the things that you would specify would be, where's the center frequency and what's the bandwidth, which is to say, over what range of frequencies are we going to push it up or down? And those are things that you've all seen because they're on, they're in any parametric equalizer. And that's not the same thing as the bandpass filter on your synthesizer. So for some reason, synthesizers, synthesizer manufacturers love the bandpass filters, whereas mixer manufacturers love the uh, shelving and peaking filters. This is called a peaking filter because it makes you a peak. Actually, so do, well, I don't know. They call them peaking filters. That's the word. Okay. Typical mixer thing is you've got a shelving filter for the highs, a shelving filter for the lows, and two usually peaking filters for pushing or pulling away from some frequency range in the middle. All right, so that's how people talk about filters. Yeah. And these also work with delays. Yeah. Uh, okay, so all all of these things are things that you may in digital land. Okay, in analog, there's a whole different way of thinking about them. But in digital land, these are things that are made with delay networks in which the delay time is always one sample. And as a result, they're horribly inefficient to make as, as patches because you have to set the block size down to one. So the only time you would make one of these in a patch is if you needed some special, weird, nonlinear filter thing that you couldn't build out of, out of the building blocks that, that you already have that someone else coded up in C for you. Which you can do, and which I have done I had to do just last fall one time. <laughs> yep, but usually you can get by with the filters that pre-exist. And usually, of course, the reason people code these filters up is because it's so horribly inefficient to make patches that make these filters because of the block size thing. Now, the next reason people don't do these things themselves is because the math is, gets genuinely complicated to make these things. The, uh, the basic deal about making low pass and high pass and band pass and peaking and shelving filters is not so bad. And um, chapter 8 goes a certain distance into that. But then when you start getting into, like, make it just so kinds of things, then it's pages and pages of math or huge software packages to do the design. So I want to give you some idea of, some idea of the theoretical framework in which that is done. But not really go down that, even as far as chapter 8 does, for lack of adequate time. So here's the, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to haul out some existing filters from PD to show you what they do, and then I will try to go back and explain what's happening on the inside. So what we'll do is we'll retrace our steps backwards, because what I did to start today off was I started with a comb filter and showed you how to make the simplest possible low-pass filter out of it. Now what I want to do is just grab some filters and start seeing what they do, and then try to justify how you would build them by 
how they act. And then I'll show you some actual math in the complex plane, and then you will all fall asleep, and then I'll see you again next Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we can do this. Uh, so filters. Um, all right, so I'm going to save this and just move on to the next one. Oh, wait a second. Did I get another? F no, it's all right. Okay, so now we're going to say patch number four. So I'll just get some filters out. Right. And maybe it's just as well to have, so this is just an all-purpose input generator thing. We'll leave that alone and we'll just start messing with filters and see what they do. So the first thing is, um, <laughs> come here. Why don't I, mm, all right, what am I going to do? I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to get rid of PD small block and I'm just going to start hauling some of these out. So there's a nice low pass filter. Oh, let's get ourselves something just to hear the original sound in case I ever need to A-B it. Hey, come here. Ah, what is wrong? Okay. All right, so let's see. We've got that going, so now we've got white noise. Good. Low pass. So the low pass filter, you can give it an argument, which is the, um, which is the cutoff frequency in hertz, or what's maybe better here is we'll get one of these things. Actually, let's get this thing. So to prevent confusion now, I'm going to get rid of this. We don't need that anymore. And now we just have <coughs> low pass filter. And while we're at it, let's get two more of these. Ugh, running out of space. Uh, all right. How's that? All right. And so then we'll get a nice, uh, simple high pass filter and a nice band pass filter. Okay, so I'm just demonstrating these. Oh, right. Band pass filter, as I mentioned, has two uh, things that you might want to control, which is a center frequency and a Q. Q for quality. And so what I'm going to do is get a nice thing that I will constrain to be positive and have that be the quality. Yeah, so it's a good thing. There is that. So low pass. This is this is what I uh, showed you before. Ooh, wait, that's high. Well, all right. So there's noise, and now we turn the cut off frequency down and you hear a drop off of the highs. This is not exactly um, not exactly the filter I built you before uh, because it's normalized differently. This one is normalized so that it has unit gain at, at uh, zero frequency or DC. Uh, whereas the thing that I showed you before, the recirculating comb filter, it might have a very nice high gain at DC. If you know, imagine feeding that thing all ones, but if it has 0.99 feedback, what's going to come out is much larger than one. It, actually, I think it'll be 100. So you could divide by that number that it would put out, and then you would get something that puts out the same amount of DC as you put in. But of course, it puts out less of everything else because it's a low-pass filter. So then you get that effect. Okay. Uh, thing about this which I will go into a little bit more later maybe, is that um, this is a control, that's to say a message input, and so I wouldn't be able to take a nice line tilde kind of envelope generator and throw it in there and, and get, um, get, the, get the right output. Um, to do that, you'd have to go somewhere else, get a different filter. But these are, these are optimized to be computationally very inexpensive and simple. This one is the high pass filter, whose job is to do the opposite. So the higher you push this, the less low frequency stuff you have. Um, 
It's not in general true, but in this case it is, or in this particular case it is true that the high, um, the high pass is exactly what you would get if you subtracted the low pass from the original signal. Uh, actually, there's a numerical accuracy issue that I'm covering up. You, you wouldn't actually implement it that way for numerical reasons, but in fact, uh, conceptually, this is just 1 minus this, or input minus that. Right. That is no longer true when you get to any more interesting filter than, than just this very simplest one. The bandpass filter, this is the one that you buy on your synthesizer. Uh, you decide a value of Q, so the number 17 came up, so I'll say the Q is 17, please, and the bandpass is, say, 69, the, sorry, the center frequency is 69, and then we hear A. I hope that's A. Anyway, if I push this up or down, get pitches out, right? So uh, a Q of 17 is a half half uh, step wide. Uh, a nice sharp filter might be, I don't know, a Q of 100. That's asking right now the, um, let's see, go back to 69, which is A. So if the center frequency is 4 or 140 and the Q is 100, that's to say that the bandwidth is 4.4 hertz. Um, the bandwidth being 4.4 hertz you can also think of as the fact that there's a, as you can, you can hear that there's the, the thing is changing. It's not a sinusoid. It's it's um, what's the right word? It's tumbling or something like that. It's fluctuating. <coughs> the speed of fluctuation of its amplitude is roughly 4.4 hertz. That's to say, is roughly the bandwidth of the filter. So if you don't want the thing to sound like it's fluctuating, you would send this Q up to something much higher. But of course. The less stuff you let through, the less power you're going to hear if you put a sinusoid, uh, sorry, if you put white noise or something like that in. So now, why don't we just take this and multiply it by 791 so that we'll pick back up the gain that we lost? Okay, watch, your, um, watch yourself when you're doing this, but let's turn this down first. And I'll just show you how to normalize this nicely for white noise. Actually, there's several ways you could think of to do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number and add 1 to it, and then multiply that by the original sound, or sorry, by the filtered sound. Now, I'm going to, you know, that's a large number. Let's start with a Q of 1 so that nothing silly happens. And now we've got, oh right, Q of 1 means the, I mean that's basically an octave wide, right? So in other words, the if the center frequency is 440, so is the bandwidth, and so it reaches from 220 to maybe 660. Um, Oh, right, I told you a quarter octave. Here's about a critical band's worth of noise. Now we're kind of in Frank Zappa and up at the north land. Here's the uh, half tone filter. And here's the very sharp filter. Or the super sharp filter. And now we're making pitches out of noise. While we're here, notice that this sucker rings. In fact, I haven't told you how to make an impulse, have I? What's a good way to make an impulse that uses, yeah? You just do it Oh, that's probably better than what I was going to do. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's make ourselves a nice impulse. I do this? Yeah, all right. I shouldn't let's cancel. I shouldn't build up to it and not do it, should I? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make a nice tape. Hey, I just do. Alright, so we're gonna make ourselves a nice table. I'm gonna uh, save some time and just say table, give it a name and a size. I don't know. And then I'm going to say in a message. 
semicolon foo starting at location zero we're going to be one and then all zeros. I think this will work the first time. <laughs> yeah, look at that. All right, there's an impulse. It doesn't look like an impulse because it's drawn using segments instead of lines, but the first number is one and the rest of the numbers are zero. And then we can say, how about uh, tab play? This is the simplest, stupidest possible way to play a table back. This one you just bang it and it out comes the table. And then we have an impulse generator. Cool. And now I'll stick this in my little adder so that we can see what it does to these various filters. There it is. So now the frequency of the filter, the center frequency of the filter is just the frequency that you hear. And furthermore, this uh, Q, or quality of the filter, could, oh, that was a thousand, sorry, you can't see that. Uh, I'll make it a hundred now. Or I'll make it 17, which is the halftone filter. It's the, it, this controls directly the length of ringing of the filter. In fact, whoops, hey. In fact, you can quantify that. The Q, in, in, another, in another way of thinking, the Q is, uh, the Q describes the number of times the filter rings before it drops down to a factor of E in amplitude. Why E? Just because life's that way. Right. So this, so that means, by the way, that the higher frequency the filter I give it, the shorter the ringing will be because it rings a certain number of cycles. It'll ring now a thousand cycles as opposed to a thousand milliseconds or something. So higher ones, a thousand cycles up there doesn't last as long as a thousand cycles down here, say. Q is the length of ringing of the filter in cycles, or Q is the frequency divided by the bandwidth, which is to say it's the sharpness of the band bandwidth divided by the frequency. Something like that. Sharpness of the bandwidth divided by one over the yeah, forget it. Frequency divided by bandwidth, which is right, which is the sharpness. Yeah. Okay. So Q is also like the width of the peak. In that sense? Or how well, yeah, so the, so the higher Q is, the narrower the peak is. Right, the, the, yeah, yeah, Q is the narrowness of the peak. But it's the narrowness of the peak compared to the center frequency, so that if you push the center frequency out, the peak will get fatter too. For a fixed Q. Right. And now that I've told you this, you know almost exactly how to build this bandpass filter. Because all you would have to do is arrange to make some kind of delay network that rings sinusoidally when you hit it with an impulse, and then you would have a bandpass filter because you would have what I have here, <laughs> and it's a bandpass filter because you saw it. That's not very good mathematics, but we'll, but, but let's do it anyway. Because, oh, another way of thinking about filters: filters are resonant bodies, right? Their mass is on springs, so or if you like, they're bodies of air inside resonating bodies um, which have resonant frequencies like Helmholtz resonators do, or whatever you might wish to make resonate. You can think of them as masses and springs. So to make a mass on a spring, you would make something that when you hit it, acts like a sinusoid that's damped. And now, I'll, now I can tell you what the, why they call it quality. If you think of it as a mass on a spring, the, as I told you, the lower Q is, the faster the thing is damped, or the higher the Q is, the longer it vibrates. The quality is, in fact, the uh, the um, percentage of the energy of the filter it maintains over a cycle, or is related to that. I, I, it's not it's not equal to that, but it goes up with that. In other words, the leakier the filter is, the more resistance you have in the thing, and the more damp it is, the lower the quality of the circuit is, in some sense. That's why it's cute. All right. So, how do you build this? Well. 
Remember I, I was telling you about complex numbers last time. We were hoping I wouldn't get back to that. But how would you make something act like a sinusoid? Well, I told you, a sinusoid is nothing but something that's getting multiplied by a constant. And b But because the constant is a complex number that's on the unit circle, say, the thing is going around a circle instead of dropping towards zero. The low-pass filter that I showed you, that was the comb filter that had a delay of 1. The trick was you took whatever the previous sample was and multiplied it by 0.99, say, and put it back in. And that gives you a very nice low-pass filter, where it gives you a thing which, when you give it an impulse, gives you an exponentially dying response. If instead of multiplying it by a real number like 0.99, you multiplied it by a complex number that had a modulus or amplitude or absolute value slightly less than 1, but also had an angle to it so that it wasn't real, then every time you multiplied it in, it would spiral. It would continue to spiral around the origin, and in fact would spiral into it, assuming you made the gain, that's to say the absolute value of the complex number less than 1, which you really ought to do, otherwise it will be unstable. So if you wanted a filter to ring forever, that's the easy thing to design. You just choose any complex number on the unit circle and just multiply the previous sample by that, and by gum they will just go around the unit circle forever. Right? In fact, that's so good that you can use that for an oscillator. And Max Matthews spent a year building oscillators out, out of this concept. It was really cool. So here, so here's how you do it. Uh, let's go, let's see, so this is the menagerie. Let's lose that and go back to, actually what I'll do is I'll open the previous patch again. And I will save it as... Number five, delay recirculate complex. There will be, oh, I didn't save the one that had the <coughs> sub, what? Didn't I have one with a sub window? Did I throw it out and not save it? Uh-oh. And this, that was, Oh, man. All right. I have to do it again. I'm sorry. In fact, did I lose everything? Oh, I have two things that are n named for something. Okay, we're being, we're being sloppy and unfortunate here. Okay, so let's close this. Do I want to save the... Yeah, let's save the changes. Sorry, I have to repeat a step here, or some steps. What I'll do is I'll make a nice sub-patch. And I will put the delay recirculating hoo-ha into the sub-patch, like this. And then I'll clean it up like this. And then I had a nice inlet tilde. Hey, no, not there, here. And that was going to get added to it. And then we were going to have another inlet that multiplied. Oh, right, that changes now. Okay, and then we had an outlet which allowed us to listen to it. Come here. All right, and here, that can go away. We don't need it. But here we're going to put this stuff in here, and then we're going to listen to the output like this. Oh, right. I want to take that out of the thing itself. All right, and this we might still need later. Not that, though. All right, there it is. Th there, roughly speaking, is what we had before. I didn't quite do it right now. What we're going to do is we're going to take this thing, and instead of multiplying it by a real number, we'll multiply this by a complex number. All right, this, this is Algebra 2 or maybe Pre-Calculus. So complex numbers have a real part and an imaginary part. So let's say delay real. Oh, real. Oh, I don't want to have it. OK, I'm, I'm going to tell it to write a delay time of 0. <laughs> that will make it, oh, but the delay reach should say something. 
I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give it a delay. I'll say half a millisecond. Uh, but I didn't give it anything to the delay read. There's no input there, which means read the shortest possible delay that you can read, which is one sample. Oh, <laughs> that's assuming I remember to do this. Block tilde 1. Okay, now... We'll do the same thing for the imaginary part. We'll have a nice delay for it. I don't need that. So what that means is we'll do another delay read, another delay write. And I'm going to do this. Okay. The whole, it will fill the whole screen very soon here. And this will be the imaginary part. Same thing with the delay write. And I'll say, you have a millisecond too, but we'll only use one sample's worth. Okay, so it, it will still be true that we'll eventually take the inlet and add it to this. But the multiplication step is going to be interesting. So to multiply complex numbers. All right, so what, okay. So first off, we need an inlet to have the complex number come in. And that inlet's going to have to have two components. Where am I going to compute what I want? I'm not sure. So let's just say inlet here and inlet there. Those, are, those could be signals or they could be control values. I'll just say control for right now. And now, the complex, to do a complex multiply, you multiply the real part by the real part. And you multiply the imaginary part by the imaginary part. And what do you do to those two numbers? Does anyone remember? You add them backwards. You subtract them. The reason you subtract them is because the i times i should be minus 1. Because that's what it is, minus 1. So you, s you take the real times the real minus the imaginary times the imaginary. And that's the real part of the product. The imaginary part of the product, see I've done this a few times, so I know how it's, what I'm going to have to do, is you take the real part of one of them and the imaginary part of the other, that's imaginary, and you also take the imaginary part of one and the real part of the other, and that's imaginary. And by the way, if I didn't do this exactly right, this is going to go unstable and blow up. So don't make a mistake when you're doing this. Or actually, I should say it differently. Put, turn the volume down when you make networks like this until you really believe they work. Okay, so there's that. Uh, we're going to say save. I'm going to, since, since Cooper was kind enough to introduce the expr object, I'm going to use an expression to compute what the complex number is going to be. Expression. Okay, what I want to do is specify an angle and a magnitude. So I'll call the magnitude, just for, just for talking, I'll call the magnitude r and I'll call the um, angle theta. So the real part of the complex number is going to be r cosine theta. So F1, the first one will be r and the second will be theta. Right? Mm, I don't know what I'm going to do then to F yet. And then the imaginary part of this complex number will be r sine theta. And what's r going to be? Well, r can be anything that you want, except it sure better be less than 1. So I'm going to do one of these things. And I'm going to restrict this to be 90. Yeah. I'm going to restrict it to only go up to 99, because I'm eh, we'll do 100. We'll allow ourselves to actually have the thing right on the unit circle. That's r. Now theta should be the frequency, but okay, so how do you figure out what theta is, the angle of the thing? Well, to the simple way of thinking is the sample rate means go all the way around the circle every sample so that you stay in one place. So you take the frequency that you want, and if the frequency were the sample rate, you would want 2 pi which is all the way around, so you take the frequency and you multiply by 2 pi divided by the sample rate. And I will just do that without saying much about it. 
I'm too lazy to compute 2 pi to more than 4 places in my head. And then we'll divide by 44, 100, which is our sample rate. And that will now be theta. By the way, it'd be good to see this to make sure we're doing it right. And furthermore, it would be nice if we change this, that we recompute all both the experts, so we should use a trigger to tell the experts to recompute when they get these. And furthermore, it would be really good now to look at those numbers. There's the real part, and here's the imaginary part. So what I've done in, in very simple terms is, okay, let's turn this off, choose a gain of uh, half to start with. So now what I've done is I've made something that does nothing. What did I do wrong? Did I do the, oh, thank you, hoo 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 boy. Dig, there are people who are not asleep yet. And is it working? It sort of looks like it's, yeah, right, okay, this is good. So now if I tell it your frequency is close to zero, it's basically real part is a half. I said that the, um, I made the magnitude a half, so it wouldn't blow up. For now. And I'm just seeing if we go around the unit circle decently well. So for frequency zero, we should see a real part of a half and an imaginary part of nothing. If I tell it Nyquist, it should go halfway around the circle and be minus 0 0.50. Oh, where's Nyquist? Uh, Nyquist is go down here and say 22050. And a, and a half of Nyquist is pure imaginary. Oh, that's a small number which isn't, wasn't zero. So it said plus because it couldn't write it out in exponential notation. That was kind of bad. But if I start. Okay, so anyway, basically as I start increasing the frequency, it starts winding its way around the unit, uh, around the circle with radius one half. And now if we listen to that, let's put noise through it. Less than convincing, huh? But of course this is a low, a high value Q, so push it close to the unit circle now. And we've got a bandpass filter. Now that was a hand wavy bandpass filter design job. but. Uh, but the, um, the punchline is the center frequency of the bandpass filter is nothing but the angle or argument of a complex number that you use to multiply inside the looping cone filter. As a result of which, if I gave this an impulse, where did I put my impulse? It was in that previous window. Okay, let's save this. Oh, let's save it as. Save as, save as, save as. This is the, yeah, let me just overwrite that. Okay, all right, so, so let me go, go back and grab the impulse generator. Uh, if I can find it. I've lost everything. Yeah, don't have it. Do, I'm, all right, I'm too lazy to make that again. If, if I put an impulse into this, you would hear the thing ring. You, you would have to because, in fact, I designed it to be something that rings when you when you send an impulse into it. I just tried to. I, I designed this bandpass filter basically by imitating the behavior of, of the bandpass filter that we observed when we just put an impulse in it. And that behavior was that it rang. So here's the thing that rings, and when we put noise in, then this recirculation gain controls how long it rings. And furthermore, let's turn this off for a second. Let's send the recirculating gain all the way up to 1. And now I'll, yeah, careful now. I'll just put a little noise in and then stop it. And ta-da, we now have a nice oscillator, which is ringing at 40 hertz, but I could change that now if I wanted to. Ooh, it hates me for some reason. Something's not working in real time. I'm, I'm, I'm abusing it in some way here, probably with, with the recirculation. Okay, so there's um, so there's a, a recirculating gain that's flat on. That's to say, a Q of infinity. Um, or if I want to make the recirculating gain less than one, maybe 0.99. 
then, oops, that's not close enough to one to let you hear it ring, is it? But if I made it real close to one, then I could make it be a nice, oh, let's make it 99.99. Now I've got this. It's a nice, very high Q, it's a Q of 10,000, I think. A high Q uh, resonating band passcode. Also known as an oscillator of sorts. Uh, that's that's the basic yoga of designing filters. And just just for the sake, oh, actually, what questions do you have about this just right now? I should show you the internals again, which I'll do. I'll show you. The yeah. It'll, it'll make it the smallest delay it can, can pull off, which is one sample. Or actually, it's one block. And since I've set the block size to one sample, in this case, it's one sample. Well, the... Uh, well, it's, it's one sample, so it's 22 microseconds. That's one way of thinking of it. Um, you wouldn't be able to get the, act the computer's audio latency down that low at all. Typical computer audio latency might be 10 milliseconds or something. Uh, it just wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, where's it going to get its number? There's no place to look. So it either does nothing or else it was something arbitrary, <laughs> which could be crash. I don't know, but anyway, the, uh, but anyway, the minimum. You know, so typical design, you know, design, um, what do you call it? Design uh, style of PD is if you ask for something out of bounds, it just gives you the thing that's within bounds, as closest to what you asked for. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is. So, so what's happening here is we have a complex <laughs> number which we're representing as the real and imaginary part as separate real numbers. And so we're using two delay lines to manage that pair of numbers, which are the two axes or the two coordinates of a complex number, if you like. And each time through the delay, every sample, what we do is we, of course, we add the invalid in and we add it as if it were a real number, which is to say we add it only to the real part. And meanwhile, we take the previous sample and multiply it by a complex number which is coming in these two inlets. So this is a complex multiplication here. And that number that's coming in, we wanted to specify in, um, in polar coordinates, that's to say specify as, a, as an absolute value and an argument or angle. Yeah? Why is the element only coming out of the real part? In other words, why are we only listening to the real part? Right. Real good question. We could listen only, well, we could listen to that or the imaginary part. The trouble with this whole, or a trouble with this whole uh, discussion is that I've been pretending that you could listen to complex valued signals, <laughs> which of course there's no way you can do because you can't, I mean, air pressure is a real number. <laughs> but you could, if you wanted to, just listen to the imaginary part of it as if it were a real number and you would get a as it turns out, you get a slightly different filter for technical reasons. It doesn't, it's not hugely different. So instead of getting this, I don't know here, I'm not putting anything in. Let's send this to, let's make some reasonable number like there. So there's the real part, and here's the imaginary part. It turns out that the real part has all the highs in it, and the imaginary part doesn't. This is, uh, to put it another way, this is a bandpass filter and this is a low-pass filter, but they're both resonant. So you actually have most of most of what the old mode VCF gave you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Don't know what'll happen. So 
here's here's that, and here's this. So it's not very different. Well, yeah, kind of different. So that's a true band pass there, I think. Oh wait, I'm sorry. This is low pass. This is true band pass. Can you hear what it sounds like if you switch the low pass? The frequency? Oh, the this thing, right? Yeah. High frequencies are getting masked up there. It sounds like they're losing energy, but I don't think they are really. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I don't know what that would give you, but of course, maybe it's a little louder. It's just something in between. Picture the complex plane next time, and show you what this what this looked like in the complex plane in slightly more detail. And then uh, we'll just get off into uh, applications of filters, some of which we've been. All right, so that's it for today.